meeting at the Unitarian Universalist Fellowship. We, um, this is an extended meeting from where we used to meet at Cafe Amici. I am so grateful to see the people here. We're getting ready to turn Georgia, Florida, and Alabama blue. So if you look to your left and look to your right, this is your core team. These are the people that are going to be doing this for you. I just want to say, uh, my name is Patricia Lassiter. Um, I sent some emails out and um, asked people to tell their friends about this, and that's why we're here. And I'm going to talk for just a couple of minutes. What I would like to do is a little housekeeping first. Is um, This is the Unitarian Universalist um, Fellowship. We have bathrooms um, right down to your, uh, right in the middle down there. There's a sign-in sheet here. Any of you who have not signed in, please sign in because... What we want to do is make sure that um, this family grows, and we want to make sure that we can get in touch with each other. And um, I wanted to um, make sure I recognized a couple of things. Um, first and foremost, even before I recognize the uh, elected officials, there's a gentleman standing up right there with the camera. His name is Harry Underwood. Today is his 31st birthday. Aww. Here is because of him, so yeah, I'll go ahead and um, so, uh, but I wanted to also um, introduce um, some of the wonderful people, um, we have wonderful people here every day, but I want to introduce some people that um, you may or may not know. First and foremost, there is a woman here who was one of Georgia's very first female state legislators, late legislators. She's 93 years old. Her name is Ms. Mary Jane Gaylor, and this is her does not begin to describe what we, what we feel for her. Um, I wanted to um, introduce um, some um, people who are running for, besides our own guest, um, running for office. There is, let me see, I have, where's, um, a, for, we have, um, okay, I'll tell you what the um, 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 seat is for. Um, there's um, District 3, Congressional U.S. Congressman, right now is, um, a person named Drew Ferguson. We have two formidable um, Democrats that are here that are um, getting ready to run against him. One is Mr. Rusty Oliver. Stand up and wait. Woo! This is, um, you know, it's kind of blood red up there, but it's, it's District 3. We can do this because we are the right people to get this done. I also want to, um, let's see, um, who else is running for anything around here besides our person? I think we're good. Let's see. Oh, okay. Uh, I'm running for uh, City Council District 7. Are you Garrett? Yes. Oh, okay. Garrett Lawrence. That's really fantastic. Um, we have, because we have, um, it's not, we don't just have Secretary of State election here, we don't have governors and all that. We have a lot of lo local elections here, and we want to make sure that all of us are involved. Another fantastic person that I would like you to meet is our Sheriff Donna Tompkins. Hi. What Donna did for this community was she showed us what happens when you have a dream, you see, you see a problem, you want to solve it, you find the people around you that will work with you, Amen. and you get it done. Yes. And she did. Yes. And we so um, I, think, um, uh, I think that's so, so good for other elected officials. Um, I am not going to talk for very, very long. I just want to make sure that you know how very grateful we are that you're here. This is our time, Georgians, Alabamans, Floridians. This is our time to get this done. In 2016, we were met with something that you know just totally broke our hearts. And um, I wanted to sort of stay on the ground in the fetal position, but I had to get up the next day. One, we had a runoff election for Donna. Um, but we all, I got to, we had to get up the next day to make sure that we are identifying ourselves as the, as the majority and doing something about what we see. 
and that's why we're here. Grateful, grateful, grateful. Um, so, um, without any further ado, um, I would love to, um, yeah, absolutely, yeah, and uh, people are on like, dragons. Um, um, I want to say one other quick thing, since um, we are at the Inter Unitarian Universalist Fellowship, we have a little bit of literature back there, and we have a woman named um, Carolyn Weinbaum, who runs the Indivisible Group here, and she has um, a petition that she would like you to take a look at and sign for a clean DACA bill. Correct. And so, on your um, while you're here, please go and look at the petitions and the um, um, the uh, what's it called the um, the the information that we have here. And so, let's see. All righty, all right. Another one, other quick thing, and that's the last thing I'm going to say is that March the fifth. And I don't usually talk about things that are happening, but there was the Rosa Parks breakfast, Amen. and um, um, we have. Um, and we would love for people to come. That's one of the very best events, and it's um, all the um, money that goes goes to that goes to um, scholarships. Uh, scholarships. Scholarships. The lead, the keynote speaker will be Stacy Abrams, and we have a woman in the back, a wonderful woman in the back named Ms. Juanita Booker, and she has tickets. So um, we would like everyone to be there. All right, now I'm done. Um, to, for the um. um um, a woman was just saying, you know, we have another elected official here, we have another elected official here. I know. And, uh, <laughs> and um, what I've done to introduce Mr. Barrow, we have our beloved mayor. Woo! Once again, she told us, taught us how to look at a problem, solve it, and get involved. Right. But also, love it to me because she's going to be running against David Perdue. Woo -hoo! Woo -hoo! And our beloved mayor is going to um, do the introduction to our fabulous um, guest, and here she is, Ms. Teresa Tomlinson. to say it is incredible to see this crowd of people at the Muskogee County Democratic Party meeting. I tell you, back in the day, uh, it would be a little slim because we were taken for granted that this was a solid blue county. Um, and, and back in the day, we were a one-party state, the other party, by the way. Uh, and so things have changed. Things have, have changed a, a great deal, and, and yet the winds are shifting yet again. And so I, I just left a, uh, a group of people where I was uh, talking about the gentleman I'm going to be introducing in just here a moment, um, and saying that you know something's going to change this election. We're either going to become a two-party state, or we're going to become yet again a one-party state. It's just going to be the other party. Uh, so. <laughs> this time around, but but it could well happen going forward, and. Um, you know, I just, I just want to say, I, you all know this, but, but it has to be vocalized, and that is, we are living in some very trying times. And, uh, and never, you know, the Republic has always been under siege by a group of folks that really don't, or the, the democracy scares them, the type of transparency, the type of, uh, government that works for all the people scares them. They'd like to keep it a little bit no more narrow. And that's always been the case. Uh, and I've written articles about it, as some of you were talking to me about. Um, but whether it was the anti-federalists or whether it was the uh, Confederates or the segregationists or the Tea Party, there were always some folks that wanted to keep things, uh, power in a pretty narrow group. Um, and, and so those forces are blowing yet again. Uh, and, and it's our time, uh, it's our time to deliver on the vision that the Founding Fathers uh, bequeathed to us. Uh, and so it, it warms my heart to see you all here, and I'm so very grateful uh, for you all, and, and thank you for what you do. Uh, keep uh, tweeting. 
keep posting, keep because you are influencing your friends who are sitting on the sidelines, okay? So let's talk a little bit about why we're here tonight. we got a lot of stuff going on. Uh, I'm so happy to see folks that are interested in all levels of government. As your mayor, I can tell you one thing that's very remarkable, again, is this is a solid blue county. We win by 25, 27 points or more when we run progressive candidates, and yet when it comes to local elections... We tend to run very conservative candidates, and they win because we don't field progressive candidates for local office. There's just something profoundly wrong with that. And so, trust me, uh, you know, I've had seven years. My time is about up. I could I could have used a lot more progressives, uh, but we but we made great progress. But this is a progressive county, and we we need. Uh, representation that reflects that and so I hope you guys will get out there and educate yourself as to all of the candidates and, and, and cast your votes accordingly all right so let me tell you why we're here because I want to eat up any more of this gentleman's uh, time uh, as you all know we have all four constitutional offices are open open seats this time the governor lieutenant governor attorney general and secretary of state and um, I was thrilled when I learned that John Barrow our former congressman from the state of Georgia, uh, five-term congressman, served 10 years in uh, the U.S. House of Representatives, represented that area from Augusta, uh, Athens, Savannah. You may say, my God, Augusta, Athens, Savannah, is that one district? No, they just kept re gerrymandering them every two years. <laughs> and, and the man kept, he would show up, take the field, and win. Uh, and then they said, well, we're going to get him next year by God. We're going to draw it so he can't win. He'd show up, he'd compete, and he would win. And he went up and he, he got it done for the people that he, of Georgia, the people he was representing, for veterans, for military families. He did a lot of great work with the George W. Bush uh, administration. And then when Obama got in office, it was smoking and going. And uh, did a lot of great stuff for us. And, and so now that he's decided to step into the Secretary of State's um, position here and, and run as a strong progressive, a strong experienced Democrat. We are so very, very fortunate to have him in this race. You're going to, to love John. He is a good soul. Uh, he grew up in Athens. Um, he's going to tell you a little bit more about himself, but I can just tell you he's going to be a phenomenal Secretary of State. Ladies and gentlemen, let's rec welcome former Congressman John Barrow. Just goes to show the many fine things claimed by Columbus were first conceived of. <laughs> <laughs> and you're gonna be able to say many fine George is gonna be able to say many fine things claimed of uh, by it. Now the road would have been started right here in the political life of Teresa Thomas. Thank you so much for your leadership. Uh, Sheriff, thank you. I am so proud that both of these ladies endorsed my campaign for Secretary of State real early on. I'm very proud to have their support. But I want to acknowledge, it's already has been acknowledged once before, if we see farther. If we can do the things we're doing in this generation, it's because we stand on the shoulders of giants. Yes. Again, thank you so much for your The vision and the, and the raw talent it took to succeed against all the obstacles that were prevalent in the mid-1970s, I am filled with awe to be in your presence. Thank you so much for your leadership. I was asked a minute ago to get up there behind this thing because they said the microphone was going to be better. How is this behaving now? Is it behaving all right? Y'all, give me the high sign when it starts misbehaving, and I'll get up there behind this thing, but I'd rather not if I could help it. Thank you for your introduction. I want to I want to tell you a little bit more about myself, put a little, a little meat on the bones about my biography a little bit, and then talk about why I'm running for Secretary of State, why it's as important as I think it is, and then what I want to do is I want to open it up to y'all's questions, because I've had 400 
town hall meetings. Wow. I mean, real town hall meetings. Not just telephone meetings. Okay. <laughs> Open encounters with the, with the citizens that I represented. And I discovered real early on that not only did I learn more about, about them, but they learned a whole lot more about me when we just talk about the things that they want to talk about. So that's what we're going to do. But I, a word of warning. I talk pretty fast when I'm nervous. There will come a time I'm going to screech and haul and see any questions. And I don't want y'all to be like my law partner who was at a hearing. I named Gene Matt Winburn. I practiced with him for many years. And he was at a hearing with his client once. And this hearing was just dragging on and on. And his client was getting more and more nervous and fidgety. Gene Matt thought everything was going fine. But his client was just getting all nervous and fidgety. After a while, Gene Matt finally shot him a shot. He was, what, what's, what's wrong with you? He said, I think, I think I need another lawyer. That guy over there, he's got two lawyers. I only got one lawyer over here. <laughs> G-Max said, well, that, that, that's okay. Only one of us can talk without us. That's the whole problem. When that one's talking, the other one's thinking. When you're talking, nobody's thinking. <laughs> and I'll have that effect on you, I know. So when I stop, be thinking about what you want to talk about when the time comes so we don't have that long, that long pregnant pause. A little bit more about, about me, because we're talking about some folks who've done some remarkable things. Uh, I didn't do this by myself with the help of a lot of good Democrats. I managed to become the first Democrat to represent my area in the U.S. House of Representatives in a decade, and the first to defeat an incumbent Republican in the Deep South in a quarter of a century. It happened from, from working together, and I promptly became the most gerrymandered member of Congress in the history of the Republic. I, I got gerrymandered from one end of the state to the other, and if we can talk just a little raw politics for just a second, not the why I want to do it or why I think it's important, but why I think I'm going to win. Let's just put that thing up on the board. They ran me all over the state. They ran me from a district that had two media markets and the one that had four media markets. They made me campaign at the highest level of intensity in mass media, TV and radio, 12 years running. In order to run me out of a job where I wasn't doing no harm and I was trying to do a little good, but they put all that effort into getting me out. What did they do? They created the largest political base of any person who's running for statewide. <laughs> the text for our message comes from the book of Genesis, the story of Joseph, when the fellow who'd been sold by his brothers, you know, hoping it'd be, it'd be the end of him, they come back 20 years later, finding he's the prime minister of Egypt. He's going to save their family and their nation. He said, I know y'all intended this for evil, but the Lord intended it for good. <laughs> so I know the gerrymanders intended it for evil, but the Lord intended it for good. Because we have a base to build on. And the base is one, I think, so represented by the folks here. I have no concerns about the future of our country. I've got a lot of concerns about where we're going to go to get there. But when I see the level of involvement, as I've seen all around the state that I see here tonight, I have no doubt that we're going to succeed I'm going to see where it counts. I want you all to think a little bit about why the Secretary of State's office counts, because it's probably the most important job that nobody knows anything about until something bad happens. <laughs> it's a job that is responsible for regulating, directly or indirectly, 700,000 people in this state who are licensed professionals or tradesmen who depend upon that office's functioning for their license to work. And every one of them is a small business or is a key person in a small business. The office is responsible for elections and overseeing the elections process in Georgia, making sure that elections are fair. And I want to talk about this as much as y'all want to talk about it. But for too long, and for too many people in Georgia, it's been hard to vote and easy to cheat. It ought to be easy to vote and hard to cheat. But it's been the wrong way for too long. And the Secretary of State's office for too many Georgians has been more of a hindrance than a help to expanding the franchise and making sure that every citizen has the right to vote. And not just the right to vote, but it ought to be as easy for every citizen to vote as it is for any citizen to vote. in other states around the country. We don't have to invent the wheel. We ought to look around and survey what they're doing and adopt best practices and work in a collaborative fashion. And believe it or not, there's actually some potential, potential, for some bipartisanship on this issue. Because at least when it comes to our election machinery, which we're going to have to change, I would decertify it in a moment if I had the authority to do so. And I will when I'm elected Secretary of State. We will have to come together on a system that folks can buy into. Because there's going to need to be some buy-in. Because today's losers are tomorrow's winners. 
And today's winners are tomorrow's losers. And we have enough to argue about, about how the winners are doing their job. And they will have enough to worry about how the, the future winners will be doing their job without having to worry about who really won. We shouldn't have to argue or worry or question whether or not someone has the right to screw up as much as they're screwing up. Because that's what the arguments are going to be unless we come together and do this in a deliberative and collaborative fashion and adopt the kind of technology and approach that everyone is doing around the country except us. And we can do that. I think that's really important. I could talk about other issues involving the job that, that, that I think are important from a, from a business point of view. I also think it's important to bring a little balance to our state government. We have got all of our political eggs in one partisan basket. And it ain't good for the long-term health of the crowd that's in charge or the state. We need to have some balance in our discussions and people who can work on positive relationships in public life. Now, y'all have more experience than I have with the felt that I'm running against. <laughs> y'all have a lot more experience than that. But I can tell you what my experience has been. I'm the kind of Democrat that the Chamber of Commerce likes to work with, and he's the kind of Republican that gives the Chamber of Commerce fits. That's something I think we can, we can build on. That is an opportunity for us to make progress, not just in winning an office, but in doing the job in such a fashion that the people get what they deserve. They get the service they're paying for, and they get the responsiveness in government that they deserve. So I said I was going to talk, I was going, I was going to go on for a minute or so, and I have. Is there anybody who would like to start our conversation about things that y'all would like to talk about? Who would like to put something on the table for us to discuss? So... Um, I've got two quick questions for you. And, it always starts like this. Uh, <laughs> two quick questions. <laughs> quick, quick, so quick. My, uh, my question is, and, and it, you kind of got on to it, unfortunately, and we've tried to vote them out, and I have, and so have most of the people in this room, but unfortunately you'll probably be running against uh, Josh McCoon. And my first question is, how do you plan to beat him? And my second question has to do with the function of the Secretary of State's office. I have had, I have, I'm a voter registrar. I've registered tons and tons of my friends to vote when we got out, when we turned 18 in high school and college and everything. Um, one of my friends, we recently, we were just, I like to go on, you know, I've, I've been hearing about these voter purges and everything. I go on and I check people's roles and everything. This guy had voted in the general election and had voted in the runoff election for, for Donna. And I went on and I checked and he had been kicked off the voter rolls. He was gone, and we had to re-register him everything. I contacted a lot of people that I thought would help and everything, and they could not find him until they, and then they did, but by that point we'd already re-registered him. And I know that's one individual case, but what do we do to stop, because if, if I hadn't checked, he would have gone in there and, you know, May 22nd and wouldn't have been able to vote. This is a problem for hundreds of thousands of people every two years who commit the unpardonable crime of deciding not to vote in a general election, usually the midterm election, when voter turnout drops by about anywhere from a third to a half the voters who vote in presidential election. Y'all know presidential elections, that's where everybody votes, right? Presidential elections are to politics what Easter Sunday is to church. <laughs> that's, that's the time you got to put out the chairs in the aisle for everybody. But you know, every church has got folks who only show up for Easter Sunday. If you don't if you don't show up for the fourth Sunday at Pentecost, no big deal, right? Because if you come back and find you gotta get gotta get baptized again. Now that that ain't right. There's a complex interplay between state and federal law on this subject, and they're not being read together as they should be and applied the way they should be, so that federal law has full effect. And federal law is very clear. You do not give the state the right to even begin the process of purging just because you choose not to vote. It's not the equivalent of proof that you move. They don't have the right to start that process. And I think we need to start applying both federal and state law fairly in such a way as to give fair meaning to both. It's going to take a, a, a lot because there are a lot of things that are going on to kind of discourage and annoy folks. Nothing more obvious, though, than the fact that some people just find it much more of an ordeal to vote than others do. Folks who are living and working at the edges, at the margins. Two jobs on, on, vote, on election day, not just one. And they're having a hard time to participate in the election process, too. We need to change all that. Back to the first question you raised. How am I going to do it? I've hinted at it already, but let me just elaborate on the fact that while you good folks over here on this side of the state have not had the pleasure 
of either watching the John Ossoff campaign in Atlanta or any of the six John Barrow elections that ran over on the eastern side of the state, you ain't seen nothing. You don't know what it's like to be in ground zero of the kind of elections that I've had to participate in. Patricia knows. I think she knows. But you got to... Did you talk to anybody who lived in Atlanta? Who got, who got the... Y'all get Atlanta TV here? No. And you saw the Ossoff thing. No, yeah. I mean, you got your own media market, but you also pick up right down the road. That Ossoff thing was pretty intense, right? My elections were twice as intense as that. It's not because I'm that big a deal. Any more than that was a big deal. It's just that $15 million goes a long way in Savannah and Augusta TV. And Macon and Albany goes a real long way. And to, to build on the point that I'm making, I've had to campaign at that level out of y'all's sight and sound for over a decade. And that creates a brand and a reputation and an, an understanding. So it gives some Democrats fits that I'm the most bipartisan member of Congress. By the numbers, when I left, I realize it prejudices my case with some folks in this room to say that, but when I left Congress, I was the most bipartisan member of Congress in Congress running for election. That means I found a way to vote with folks on the other side of the aisle more often than anybody else on either side of the aisle. And I had to defend that record before a sometimes supportive but sometimes hostile audience. But to do that consistently, year in and year out, at the, under the most intense barrage of negative and, and, and just partisan advertising, you, you get something for that. I've got a name ID and a brand as a bipartisan cooperator across half the state, half the territory of the state. In fact, I think if you look at it, every major media market in the state that's entirely inside the state, except Atlanta, I've campaigned in. That's half the territory of the state and one-third of the population. No one who's running on the other side has a political base like that to build on. Not only are their bases very small, they haven't had to compete at that level of intensity for a sustained period of time. So a big part of how I'm going to do it is I'm going to run up the score in that part of the state where I'm pretty well known, where it's easy to do, I'm going to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with an Atlanta media market, and that's how we're going to beat them. I'm getting a lot of trouble trying to decide who's next. I've learned that a long time ago. It's a very dangerous thing. I wish I'd recognize somebody else to do it. But the sheriff's hand went up just after the gentleman over here. You go, you go first, Sheriff. Just a question. Um, educate me a little bit. The relationship between the Secretary of State, the Governor, and the Lieutenant Governor, is there a relationship? Is there a way that you can have impact in that area? Absolutely. The state constitution, in its wisdom, breaks up the executive function of government into several departments, all of which depend upon a certain degree of collaboration and cooperation with the primary agency of the state legislature and the governor. But it takes the function for running the things of the Secretary of State, invested in an independently elected official who can come from another party, another brand, altogether. But they have to cooperate. They have to work together. You know, in a lot of states, you don't have this chance to build the executive team of your own. In a lot of states, you're stuck with the, the team that's assembled by the head person on the ticket. You vote for governor of Florida, they give you a whole cabinet. You didn't choose any of them. But we got the right in Georgia, because our forefathers thought it was important, to make sure that the people have the right to choose who their attorney general will be. That the people have the right to choose who their lieutenant governor will be. That the people have the right to choose who their secretary of state will be. Because they know that too much power in too few hands is not a good idea. And what a waste it is for us not to look at the candidates running these jobs and decide them on the merits. That's one of the challenges we got in this election. And I'm going to meet that challenge. But there are important ways in which we can collaborate, but we have to work together. And frankly, I think it ought to be that way. It really ought to be that way in Washington. It ought to be that way in Atlanta. And it's going to be that way when I'm one of the constitutional officers will have responsibility for carrying out the administrative laws that the General Assembly have to pay for, but we have to do this together. Administration and oversight working together. I can't say we've had much of that in state government for some time now. You're certainly not getting that in Washington. Yes, sir. Thank you so much for coming and joining us down here, uh, Congressman um, Here in Columbus and across the state and across this country, we do have a lot of folks and different groups with like Indivisible, um, and a lot of progressive-leading groups. 
Um, you've been identified by some as a Blue Dog Democrat, and you get rightfully said to yourself that you are bipartisan. I'm a Blue Dog Democrat. <laughs> how, how, do you, how do you believe that you will be able to connect with the divided party that we have, that are some of the Bernie Cracks versus the Hillary folks that are still seeing some of those divisions within our own party, even here in the county? Um, that have different views on what our candidates should bring to the table and where they're drawing the line in the sand for making a decision on what we want to be moving forward with our candidates. Very good question. First off, none of the divisions that you've referred to, so far as I know, reveal any fissure or difference of opinion within the Democratic Party. And I might add, not with well-meaning, open-minded folks or either independents or fair-minded Republicans. Shouldn't bother them at all. I'm not running to be a policymaker. I'm running to administer the laws that the state legislature passes to make sure that our businesses are served properly and that our elections are conducted fairly. I'm going to do that. Also, in addition to the fact that there really is no area where my policy differences with the majority of the caucus, let's say in Washington, has any material impact on the job I'm running for. I'll go you one better than that. Democrats have shown a pretty good talent for nominating people who ought to get elected. It would be nice if they could nominate someone who can get elected. <laughs> it would be very nice if our candidates could get elected. And the very thing that some folks might regard as sort of, you know, lack of democratic bona fides is actually proof positive of a bipartisan, collaborative approach toward the issues that tend to cause people to divide in favor. We shouldn't be dividing over the conduct of our elections. We shouldn't have any division on that. We should all be united in that. And on that matter, I might point out, my score, if you want to call it that, as a, as a Democrat, is as strong as anybody else's. I voted for the Voting Rights Act renewal in 2006. Stand, proud to stand right alongside of John Lewis and Sanford Bishop and Hank Johnson to signal my support. For the I know how mistaken and how wrong-headed the Supreme Court decision was that gutted that law. And I also know how important that makes the Secretary of State's office today compared to what it was then. We used to have a federal watchdog on the beat. I think they engaged in a lot of mischief in decades past, in ways that kind of affected our politics in this part of the country. We put all that aside. There is no federal watchdog to speak of now. And it is the responsibility of the Secretary of State's office to make sure that our laws are being followed in compliance with both state and federal law and done fairly. And that's what I'm going to do. And no Democrat and no Republican should want anything more or less. Um, what do you think about the paper ballot initiative? It's a great idea. This is a back to the future moment where the best technology for us going forward is the technology they use to use a paper and a pencil. Now, I'm not a troglodyte. I know that there are useful ways to, to utilize technology. For folks who are impaired voters, for example, you can use machines that are, in, in, in essence, effectively souped up printers that can print your ballot if you cannot otherwise record your, you know, denominate your choice. And there are ways in which we can use machines to screen a ballot before it's put into the box in such a way as to give a helpful suggestion that maybe you've overcounted or overvoted or undervoted, you missed something, or you've got that crazy ballot like that poor ballot in Virginia at the side of the, the entire fate of the, the Virginia House of Delegates. There are machines we can use that don't count the vote, they don't constantly vote, but they, they just look at it, just kick it back if there's a problem. There are lots of ways in which we can use technology to vastly improve the oldest technology on the book and the only one that gives us a basis for deciding who really won a contested yes. election. Yes. And I am for that. i also tell you there is some growing bipartisanship on this issue in the state legislature, in the state committee on science and technology. I've attended uh, some of their hearings, and they've had people testify there, and they know, they know that the machinery we're using does not meet the legal standards set forth in Georgia law. They know it's not been certified by the Secretary of State as it should be. They know that. And they don't want this issue to become an issue that's going to hurt them down the road. They're moving forward in some fashion. We need to make sure that we are a part of that discussion so that we will have buy-in to the results just as they want to have buy-in to the results. Because the last thing they want to do is have another expensive round of investment in technology that turns out to be a bust. That would be a bloody shirt that we'd be waiting for a number of elections to try and establish our you know, right to take a turn. It should be done in a collaborative fashion where everybody can agree with the results.
Like I said, we're going to disagree enough over the merits of the results. We shouldn't be disagreeing over who actually won. So you had your hand up first, and then, then you, sir. Well, this uh, question has to do with the integrity of the Office of the Secretary of State mm -hmm. and voter registration. Um, I, I can't keep up with the David here for the number of uh, folks uh, that I've registered, but I'm from the county just north of here, Harris. Mm -hmm. And uh, I discovered that it was the same in every county that my county touches. The people who were really into and working hard on registering people to vote did not trust the Secretary of State's office to actually uh, process the, you know, the, the form if, if an individual wanted to take it, fill it out at home, and then mail it in. Uh, and so we had to, uh, like, personally, you know, carry the, the forms in, you know, every few days. Uh, to our, you know, to whatever county's, uh, you know, voter registration office, you know, to give to the to the registrar of that county, and it seems like to me, I mean, I remember, uh, you know, growing up in the in the '60s when everybody trusted the Secretary of State's office, and it, you know, you wouldn't want run across that, or you could register to vote, you know, at any at any public place just about, and that's not the case. Do you have plans in place to? You know, to bring the trust back and... Uh, the only way to do that is to feed both sides out of the same spoon and not be playing favorites. That's the only way to do it, really. And there are some things that have, that have come like we haven't even talked about. Some of the things that are going on are just ridiculous. The exact match program, for example, that has kicked out thousands of votes because a government typist transferring information from one medium to another has misspelled someone's name or put the accent mark over the wrong letter, or maybe put the accent mark in the wrong direction, and thereby striking someone from the polls. When the same standard we use to apply to, to the question of how someone voted requires a common sense preponderance of the evidence test, we got this exact match thing which says it's a game of gotcha. And long after you're gone, when you're not there to, 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 to explain yourself, what you've applied for has been thrown out. That shouldn't happen. We should apply the same standard to some of the question who's registered as we do to, to settle big lawsuits. You know, that'll be a common sense standard to find out what the real facts are. I can assure you that's how the lawsuit will come arising out of some of that's going to be decided. So why don't we administer the law in much the same common sense fashion? We don't, we're not doing that now. We've had one lawsuit after another been brought against the incumbent, and they've all been settled. With the incumbent promising not to do it anymore, and he comes out and he says, well, we won that one. <laughs> We ought, not to, we ought not to be conducting business that way. And the best way to earn the confidence of folks who are, who are on one side of the other election is to conduct yourself in such a fashion that they haven't got a legitimate complaint about what you're doing. I'm afraid that's going to take leadership. It's going to take somebody who's actually getting the chance to do the job right and actually behaves in that fashion. Trust but verify. Yes, sir, and then you ma'am. I know you're very concerned about gerrymandering. And I think yeah, we haven't talked about that at all. That's my favorite subject. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think you might have even written something about that. What can we do to help support, of course, the redistricting reform that we need so badly? Well, thank you for that. And I want, to, I want to return to a point we began with. There seems to be some sort of breast beating around here about we're not able to win certain times of elections. We're able to win at some levels with lines they can't gerrymander, right? But there's some funny thing about these other lines, where they get to draw the lines, politicians choosing the voters, somehow it's kind of hard for the folks to have their voice felt. It's not your fault. It's the gerrymanderer's fault. And there's something we can do about it. Now, I'm going to, I'm going to be right up front and say this, this, the role of Secretary of State is somewhat limited in this, but I plan on being just as expansive and open with that role as an advocate for gerrymandering reform as I possibly can be. And I've been a pretty effective advocate for reform. I've written articles in the Washington Post, and I've got an article coming out next month in the Harvard Journal on Legislation for your insomnia relief. <laughs> <laughs> they will tell the courts how I think they can solve this problem without creating the problem they're worried about. They don't want to avoid the problem of legislators deciding electoral outcomes, but they don't want to solve that problem by having judges decide electoral outcomes. That's their hang-up. And it's a way out of that puzzle, but no one's talking about it. But here's where the Secretary of State's office comes in. I would have no responsibility for the drawing of the lines. Okay? That's, that's solemnly vested 
and the General Assembly and the Governor has a, the right to sign the bills or veto them as any other ordinary legislation. But I would be a necessary party in any litigation challenging the administration of an election under allegedly unconstitutional partisan gerrymanders. And I'd love to be a party <laughs> to a lawsuit, whereas right now they're all singing off the same partisan song sheet. You got a governor from one party, you got an attorney general from one party, you got a secretary of state from one party, you got a legislative house leader from one party and a senate leader from another. We're all singing off the same song sheet. Wouldn't it be nice to have just one fly in that ointment? <laughs> and would have the right, a really a right that no lawyer has, as a client chosen by you and accountable to all of the people, including the Republicans who are going to cross over and vote for me, who'd be accountable to all those people saying, this is not the way our line should be drawn. Politicians should not choose their voters. Voters should choose their representatives. So Mr. McCoon and others are mocking me. He obviously doesn't understand the process. I understand the process very well. They voted for the worst gerrymander in the country. Ours are the least competitive legislative House seats in the country by the numbers. And our congressional elections are just there as well. And that's their idea of, of how to do it. My idea is we ought to make more competitive districts where voters of all stripes will have more of a say-so in the outcome. That won't be what some Democrats want in some places, but I'll tell you it's a whole lot better than what we've got now. And it's the only way to create a climate where, you can, where the politics of the situation can promote candidates who are actually willing to work with each other. How can you expect someone to cross the aisle and vote with someone in a legislative assembly if someone back home can't cross the aisle and vote for someone on the, on the other side of the kind? We'll get more of that with competitive districts than we get with lopsided districts of the kind we have now. The fault, dear Brutus, lies not in our cells or even in our stars. It lies in the districts that are made to order. And that is something we can and must fix. It is the most corrosive thing in American politics that we can actually do something about. Right. Yes, ma'am, I think you had your hand. Yes. Just a basic question about voter um, photo identification. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it seems to, to actually um, you know, go against a lot of voters who would normally go Democrat. I know that I've lived in different states and when I moved to Georgia, Getting a driver's license when I already had a driver's license, the requirements to me were ridiculous. So what are your thoughts on you know how to make this better for voters, you know, wanting to just come and vote without going having to go through all these hoops to have, you know, a specific type of um, photo identification? I believe that it is a legitimate concern that folks be who they say they are when they show at polls. And we we should acknowledge that and say we agree with that too. But if you've allowed the entire society to vote under one set of rules for 30, 40, 50 years, have some folks voting since really the Voting Rights Act was enacted in 1965, then to impose a new requirement, and an environment that's, a requirement that's far more burdensome for some folks to get than others, the excuse for the justification that it falls on the just and unjust alike, that it falls on the and Democrats alike, is the sad point. We shouldn't be imposing an undue burden on anybody especially if it has a disparate impact for the polls. But we shouldn't just be concerned about the disparate impact, we should be concerned about the impact on anybody who's a lawful citizen and has been voting for a long time. It seems to me if you're going to change the rules to require a new form of ID, it's your burden to provide them with that ID. Yes, Simple enough problem to solve. We can all own the results. I certainly think you ought to be able to prove who you are when you say you are. And I'm, I'll, I'll give the other side of that argument that point. They also ought to be concerned about making sure that it's as easy to vote for everybody as it is for anybody, and includes as easy to register. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am? Um, I want to make sure that this is still true, that people in nursing homes who have not been um, adjudicated incompetent, and people in jails who are not felons, and people in mental health hospitals, they all have the right to vote unless they've been declared incompetent. Is that not correct? I think it's the law that you have to have your rights removed in some form or process. That is correct. And under Georgia law, I think you've just got three most common circumstances where folks who have the capacity at one time can lose it as a result of things that are their responsibility, in the case of people convicted of felonies, or also things beyond their control. Okay, I just wanted to be sure of that. 
This only points out that there, there's more than one way, you know, to, to rig an election. But I think the most insidious way is the one that makes it harder for some folks to vote than others. That's the part that no one thinks about. But I think about it because it affects a lot of people, especially folks who are living and working at the margins, who are working the hardest, whose right to be heard is just as great as anybody who lives on West Bases Ferry drive in Atlanta. Yes, sir? Hi. Uh, that begs the question when you're talking about the people who are living on the edge. And a number of people have debated about having a holiday, I hate to use that word, but a day that's set aside for elections where you can live legitimately go in, you don't have to worry about clucking in, clocking out, etc. Is there any possibility of that ever becoming something? I do not know. I'm wide open to anything that would make it easier for folks to participate in the political process. But what I would personally support and what I think the legislature would go for are two different things. I do think we can all begin on areas of common interest. And the most common area of interest, I think, and this is giving the other side you know, the benefit of, of their concerns, is we make sure the elections aren't, the outcomes aren't in doubt. I mean, we make it harder for some folks to vote than others. But let's don't be in doubt about how those folks actually voted. I think we build and start with that. It happens to be the thing we're going to have to deal with because we are going to get rid of this machine or we are going to replace it. We're going to have to move into a new technology that we have more confidence in than what we got right now. And I think that's the starting point for the discussion you want to have. There are lots of other models besides holidays which adhere to the old model of people coming to the polls on one given day. There are other approaches being explored by some states as surprisingly different as Utah and Oregon. Utah where they're doing it on a local option basis. I personally would favor uh, any sort of decentralizing of this process that doesn't make it harder for folks to vote, but make it easier for folks to vote. And see how quickly this would spread once there's been an experiment. We could use our 159 counties as sort of a laboratory of democracy if we wanted to. Because I can tell you that the election officials I've spoken with all around the state have one thing in common. They don't want to be in a lawsuit. They don't want to be any any headlines. And they're as, as concerned as anybody about the fact that things can happen with this very rickety, overly uh, complicated, and underserved technology that we're using now. And they too would like us to return to a day when it can be done a whole lot easier and with more confidence in the results. But to take on, to build on your point, I think we got to start with areas of agreement. And then we have, then I, I'm in favor of exploring ways of doing this, like other states are doing it, that are both cheaper for the taxpayer, a whole lot easier for the voters, and you got absolute confidence in the results. Those are things we have to acknowledge. The other side's going to argue, the other side, I, I mean the other party, just the other side of any discussion, including the party, we're going to have to recognize the legitimate questions and concerns they're going to have by doing anything new. But we have to come together and talk about this. But one thing we have to do is take the first step. I think that's, that's, that's on the plate right now. Is it Harry? Yes. Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, big question about, the con about our constitution and about the process of uh, voting. So we are one of, like, the major I guess maybe the majority of states in the United States that doesn't allow for uh, for people to file petitions uh, for uh, for putting a, a question on the ballot uh, across the state. Um, Florida does that for like, a, but not exactly the same level as say California, Arizona, Oklahoma, etc. And I think that it, because we rely so much on legislative referral, not just for uh, for statewide votes, but also even for county votes, like here in Missouri County, mm -hmm. we have to rely on them in order to approve the ballots. That's right. And, right. And I feel that, that, that that's taking a lot of, um, of power out of the hands of, uh, of, of voters, and <coughs> hence it's delaying a lot of progressions that could happen uh, that are happening on the, in these uh, western states, but not as much over here because we don't allow for people to make, uh, to, uh, to vote on to vote on these by way of initiative and referendum. And so I know that you that your your job is to uh, as Secretary of State is to um, to make uh, to enforce the Constitution, the state Constitution, which is our <coughs> the United state Constitution, the whole union, by the way. Um, but is it also possible to use your holding pulpit as Secretary of State? In order to push for a liberalization of these laws to make and to put us on that part, we can allow for something like Florida's regime of allowing for petitions to be filed in order to, uh, to put questions on the ballot for constitutional and statutory um, questions. I would not advocate mm -hmm. for an expansion of the popular initiative okay. without pointing out at the same time, without pointing out 
that the, the, what the other side of the argument would be is it creates a constant churning of your politics and an invitation of big money players into the initiative and referendum process. It is not as simple as it sounded to the Lafollette brothers when they invented the initiative a hundred years ago, when it got adopted out in western states where they had more you know, a popular sentiment then. It is more complicated than that, but I know this. The reason you have an initiative in the states where they have it is because of popular frustration with unrepresentative government. The reason for an initiative in those handful of states that adopted it, because the politics in those days were as gummed up by partisans, winner-take-all types, who wouldn't listen to work with folks who represented the other side of the tracks. Politics was so gummed up and constipated that the only way they felt around that problem was to give the people a direct role in legislation. That is a problem. There's a downside to that. But there's no getting away from the reason for that. I think the most basic thing we have to deal with, the most basic problem, is that we're a un, we are a representative democracy with unrepresentative representatives. That's the basic problem. And this problem is not unique to one side. You do not create safe seats for the other side and safe seats for your side without making your seats just as partisan as the other side. The old saw that a 52 or 54 percent district was a dangerous thing that you cut it too close and you might lose yourself, and therefore it's sort of a self-correcting problem. That might have been the, the, the case when Sandra Day O'Connor was reading about that in the mid-1980s. It ain't the case today. Today, we have districts that are more partisan than the jurisdictions they're carved out of, whether it's city councils or county commissions in lots of instances, but certainly state houses and state senate districts. Districts that are far more, rep more partisan than the state as a whole. Districts where the only people who can successfully be elected in those districts are people who are more partisan than their primary voters. So get this picture. We got 435 seats in the U.S. House of Representatives. Only about 15 to 20 of them are genuinely competitive election in and election out. I used to represent one until it was extinguished by three gerrymanders. But what you got is, you got 420 out of 435 districts that are more partisan than the states they're carved out of, and the people that represent those districts are more partisan than their districts. That is the exponential effect of primary elections with polarized voters on both sides of the aisle being fed through this system where only the primary winner can be elected, and the last election you ever have to worry about is your very first primary election. That's a problem. We have that with or without the initiative. The main reason we have the initiative is some folks had that problem so big they couldn't think of any way around that. But we still have to address that underlying problem. And until we get more representative districts, districts that represent the state as a whole, a little more balanced in their composition, we'll never get more representative representatives. That is our key problem, and it's a problem that won't go away. And I, I guarantee you that if you address that problem, which we have to address, the other problem would almost certainly take care of itself. Yes, ma'am, and yes, ma'am. The first you. Yes, um, as a former citizen of California, I can tell you I was absolutely appalled the first time I had a chance to vote here in Georgia. And I look at the ballot, and there are propositions on there with no information. Mm -hmm. And the first time the vast majority of citizens learn about a particular proposition is when they're standing there looking at the ballot and saying, oh my God. <laughs> Plus, they seem to have a tendency here of wording the proposition so that it is exactly opposite what you're thinking of what you would really vote for. What In do fact, you do about that? I can do something about that. Funny you should ask that question. <laughs> <laughs> because because it does highlight the difference from what we were talking about a minute ago. We don't have the power of popular initiative in Georgia. But the politicians do have to come to us from time to time. Every time they want to do something the Constitution doesn't allow them to do, they got to bring us an amendment to vote on it, and they soft, they sell it. They soft sell it by saying what a great thing it'll be, but what it'll do is it'll allow them to do something the Constitution currently doesn't allow them to do. And in many cases, I'm sure that's a good idea. But how about that school thing they voted down? 60-something percent of the voters voted down, even though it was the sweetest sounding thing on the ballot. Here's one role that the Secretary of State can play in this. The Secretary of State doesn't control the language that appears on the ballot. 
But the Secretary of State is one of three officials who has to sign off on a statement of what the purpose and meaning of this, law, of this proposed amendment is. It has to be published in 20 papers of general circulation around the state and more. And right now you've got an unholy alliance between the people who are responsible for that, singing off the same song sheet, Attorney General, Secretary of State, and Legislative Council, telling people what's in this stew, what's in this hash. And it seems to me that if we had somebody in there who was looking at it from a slightly different perspective, that we'd all either have to agree on the language, or we'd have a little disagreement about it, and the language would have to be settled otherwise. It would shine a light on the problem. And I'm not at all interested in continuing to bamboozle voters with fraudulent statements of what the intent of a, of, a, of a bill is. It ought to be meaningful. We give this important power of explanation to these independent offices in the theory that because they're independent, they'll actually take a good independent look at what it is and give a straight account of what it means. I don't think we've had enough of that. Obviously, the voters don't. Voters who've returned regularly for 20 years now uh, the, the, the candidates of one party have regularly had some of these amendments shot down by voters who think, I don't think that's what it means at all. Someone's not doing their job. I'd like to have a role in that, if only to try and make sure that the explanation of what's being sold, the bill of goods that's being put out there, actually describes what folks are being asked to vote on. A very good suggestion. Follow up. Do you have the, or does the Secretary of State have the authority to put out any kind of educational material. Now, I know California goes overboard on propositions. They, oh, you bet they do. But, <laughs> oh, yes. but they also put out a booklet. The last one I received as a citizen of California was half an inch thick. The first thing was the actual legal wording of each proposition. Right. Then there was shall we call it a translation into English. Mm -hmm. Then there was a statement by the pro folks over why this proposition was such a wonderful idea. Then there was a statement by the con folks a about, debate. about why this proposition was just terrible and awful and nobody should vote for it. Then there was a statement by the pro folks about why the con folks were wrong. <laughs> you can see a part of the problem with the initiative process is, right. that, is that either side can gum it up so much that nobody can but understand it. But when you read this stuff, mm -hmm. you least had you a sense of what was what the good arguments were, what the bad are. You know, does this make sense to you? Do you have any kind, uh, uh, if you get elected, of putting out? even if it has to go into newspapers, some kind of serious discussion, and we don't seem to get enough discussions in this state anyway, especially with these, these <coughs> districts which are, you know the third is going to go Republican because it always goes Republican, and so we never get a discussion of issues. We certainly never get a discussion of propositions. I don't know if it will be enough to inject the checks and balances that are designed in our Constitution into the process. An independent Secretary of State, an independent Attorney General, and the Legislative Council who works for the legislature, actually having to agree on the language. I know you won't get much. You won't get much if it's if it's entirely partisan. If the same people are singing off the same song sheet, I know you won't get the straight story from them. And it won't be a trip. It won't be necessarily a trip to any bad motives to folks. Folks who can lie to themselves can lie to others with far more efficiency than anybody else. If you think what you're selling is the greatest stuff in the world, it's you know, it's it's easy to persuade somebody else of that. Mr. Barrow, can we just have a couple more questions? A couple more questions. Yeah. And this, and this I know that Ms. Florence has a question, and then maybe... Okay. Tracy. Uh, uh, were you going to last? She was she was first, but, you, but, but, but yeah, I, mean, I, mean, I mean, directed your way, and I was asked to let somebody else direct me, so... What? She would yield to the lady in the rear? Uh, yeah, that's fine. All right, and then I'll come back to you. How about that? I'm sorry. That's all right. That's what I said. You can't see it. I'm... They're going to have to learn the hard way about the, the price of not voting. They're going to have to learn the hard way the price of not voting. And I, and, I, and I think they are. I'm going to certainly do everything I can through the limits of the office to encourage folks to see the importance of what they do. But help, help me with your... With your... Well, um, I've, I've heard you mention about the 
actually, I think the kids know more about this than we do, or the, or the, than, our, than our masters in Atlanta. I think they know that this technology is not reliable. Because they, they have a better understanding of how things can jump the wall. They have an understanding of how things are, are managed and, and manipulated every time you load a ballot in one of these things. I mean, they have more savvy. And the folks who know the most really know more than the rest of us about how unreliable our current technology is. Many of them are discouraged and they feel that it's rigged anyway. So why vote? Why even bother? So do you have any suggestions for us? It's hard for those of us. I imagine everybody in this room votes. It's hard for those of us to be able to relate to somebody who thinks it doesn't matter to vote. Maybe they don't know how hard we fought to get the vote. Maybe they don't realize how the vote used to be abused in this country when we had the so-called Australian ballot. Maybe they don't know. But I know this. We've got to help them understand the issue. Sometimes your opponent can do things for you that you cannot do for yourself. Maybe Mr. Trump will do a better job of educating folks to the importance of the political process than we, good, good government types, could ever do on our own. It shouldn't have to come to that, I grant you, but education comes in all forms. It takes all kinds to, to educate a generation as to what, they, what their responsibilities are. They can do that, but they also have to know that if you win by enough votes, they can't do that. Sometimes sometimes you have to work a little extra harder or run up a bigger margin. Listen, we've got all kinds of problems on the good government side of, of the ledger. A lot of people who won't shoulder their musket and take their place in line. There's sunshine patriots, there's summertime soldiers. You know, there are lots of problems like that. And the only blessing is the other side's got some problems with that too. But that does not excuse us from doing everything we can to reach everybody that can be reached in this room. By the folks that you can reach it, you reach it. You for the last question. Oops, I, I didn't recognize this lady five minutes ago, and then back there. I'll be, I'll be very brief. Thank you. I've been known to be involved in a few campaigns. I like to consider myself an informed citizen. I've had to tangle with that Secretary of State website on more than one occasion. Me too. And oh my God. I mean, you almost need a graduate level seminar to be able to find what you want to find on that site. Would you be willing to dedicate some resources to straighten that mess out? Absolutely. In fact, and, there are there are lots of better models that we can build on. We can look around, but we have to work with the folks who will pay the bills. But yes, I will be. I will. I'm committed to doing that because every it seems every pro, government program, especially, is prone to this problem. You keep putting on fixes, keep on changing looks, and it becomes more and more rickety, more and more prone to problems, more and more harder and harder to find the stuff you need to find. That's a problem I've heard everywhere, and I want to address that. Thank you. Is your Secretary of State? Yes, ma'am. I'm going to go out on a limb and assume that I've talked to a lot of people around. Um, I believe that somebody does the crime that they have time, and then they should have their own rights restored. I believe in that too. I think lifetime. I think lifetime penalties. Uh, I think it, personally, this is a personal job. Now I'm going to. I'm going to. I'm going to play the ball where it lies. I'm going to administer the law as I'm required to. But if anybody asks me. How it ought to be done. I think if they're not going, if they're not going to give you three hots and a cot and lock you up, they're going to make you take care of yourself. They make you take care of your responsibilities. Make you work. Make you support your dependents. Make you go out and get a living and support yourself. And I think you ought to have the right to vote. Do you think that has a chance of getting through? I don't know. I, I, it, this is a, this is this is a crowd that, that feels. There are people who feel differently about it. They feel like some 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 mistakes should never stop paying for. Is what some people believe. I, be I believe that most folks are fair-minded on this and realize there should be no lifetime penalty. That the state's not going to take away your liberty, and you ought to be free to vote. Now, listen. I want to say something. For, for, uh, Patricia's going to come up here and take the microphone from me. Listen, I signed up for this gig. I, I'm doing this 24/7. I'm giving this election literally everything I have got. I've been doing it for 12 years, so I know what that kind of commitment looks like. My being here is nothing. Your being here is everything. If I wasn't here, there'd be somebody else standing in my place. Not as good as me. There'd be somebody taking my place. But if you weren't sitting here, there would be nobody taking your place. There are people that you can reach 
that nobody else can reach. There are people that you could reach on my behalf that I could never reach on my own. But you have an ability to do something that literally nobody else has to do. And you're not running for a, for a job like I am. I don't need the job, but I'm running for a job to do a job. You're volunteering. And by my lights, what y'all are doing is a whole lot more valuable than what I'm doing. Because if I wasn't here, there'd be somebody in my place, but nobody taking your place. Thank you for caring enough to get involved. Y'all get involved in this election, and we're going to start to turn that tide. Start giving some trust to people hanging out here right now, and we'll start running things on the up and square again in Georgia. Thank you very much. Before everyone goes, I just don't want to take them a lot of time, but I want you to, as I said, look back and forth. These are the people that you're going to be working with. Introduce yourselves to the people that are working, that are running for office. Introduce yourselves to each other. Make sure that we are in partnership here. On the back table, um, behind the panel over there, we have some um, Muskogee County Democratic Committee um, forms. If you'd like to sign up to be a member, we have some indivisible form um, um, petitions against DACA. We have a donation um, um, bowl, of course. I am so grateful to the Unitarian Universalist. Um, Fellowship of Columbus for having us here. One, I'm a member, yay. And, um, and, um, and I would like to, I didn't, um, before I wanted to actually um, introduce our president, Mr. Bill Harlan. So, um, finish up the food, get to know each other, let's get ready to turn Georgia blue, and um, let's call it a day. Thank you.